What is going on, everyone? My name is Ray. I uh, will be doing a sh uh, a stream with uh, Bonnie and the Mere Mortals. Uh, real quick, I just want to introduce myself. I am a music reviewer for uh, 570 Press. I've been with the team for a couple months now, and I'm really excited to bring on our featured guest tonight, uh, Bonnie. So let's go ahead, bring her on here, uh, and have a have a good time with this. Hey there. Hey, Bonnie. How's it going? I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing just fine. It's wrapping up this, uh, you know, holiday week here, so. Oh yeah, it's it's been a time this week. We got snow, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that too much. Oh yeah. So I wanted to uh, know how did uh, you become a, a musician? How did I become a musician? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I've been playing music for as long as that was a, a thing a kid could do. Um, probably I had my first band like the end of grade school doing, uh, you know, AFI and Green Day covers and Blink-182. And oh, cool. <laughs> um, then I uh, had a couple other bands and then I played with a metal band for about nine years um and then got the idea for this project and and started working on some demos by myself and found some folks mostly on craigslist and uh here i am that's awesome yeah no i i, I definitely checked out the single i love it it's uh definitely you know something that i really i really enjoy i'm i'm like someone who is not too big into a um you know, a lot of a lot of newer songs coming out, but yours I really did enjoy. Um, I do want to check out uh, some of those older bands you've been in, uh, <laughs> like the metal projects and stuff. So that would be cool to see. Uh, in terms of your band name, how did you come up with it? Does it have like a significant meaning? Anything like that? Um, you know, I think all musicians out there who've had a a number of bands, the uh. Uh, I sort of keep a, a list of possible band names in my phone at all times in my notes. I don't know if you're the same, but uh, mm -hmm. I really wanted a Bonnie and the name. And uh, the Mere Mortals, well, while not directly related to this quote, because I mean, it's not directly evident, but uh, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis um, that states, something like you have never met a mere mortal and it has this idea that every interaction you have with a person is either going to change them, you know, make them worse, make them akin to something like a, like a demon or uh, to raise them up to make them better, um, to, uh, you know, make them something like a, like a demigod or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about that quote a lot and um, think about my, you know, as it relates to my interactions with everyone every day, that uh, you've never met a mere mortal and everyone you meet, every interaction that you have with them is either going to make them better or, or worse. So um, I just kind of always wanted to have some sort of project with mere mortal in it somewhere. And I mean, it just sounds good. Yeah, no, I, I like the name. It, it's definitely, uh, it brings me back to a lot of older bands that used to use that uh, kind of, type of uh, band name. So I think it's, I think it's still really cool. Um, what was the songwriting process like? Uh, songwriting, I started this project out. So I, I guess I got to talk about my background a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, of course. So I grew up on a cattle ranch, I guess it would technically be called. Um, on the border of the West Virginian Panhandle. Um, for those of your listeners that are in Pittsburgh, it's about 30 minutes further into nowhere from Star Lake. Um, and growing up there was like all country all the time. And growing up in the 90s especially was all Garth Brooks and Reba McIntyre and the Dixie Chicks and um, a lot of my friends' parents were listening to older stuff like, you know, George Jones, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, 
mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And when I was really little, I really liked it. Um, but then as soon as I could rebel even a little bit, you know, out of that small town sort of mentality, I started getting more and more into like any type of gothic music, you know, synth wave, new wave, post punk, all that. Um, and I immediately wanted to leave that town as soon as possible. <laughs> and I did. I moved out when I was 17 and in, into Pittsburgh. Um, and like didn't want anyone to know that uh, that I'd come up that way. I didn't want anyone to think I was like a dumb hick or a rude or something. Because uh, I'd come from such a you know, sheltered, bigoted background. Um, and so I, I sort of put all that stuff away in the, in the closet for a long time. But the more I got into gothic stuff and, and what I liked about, say, like the Cures songwriting or, you know, any of that, it's all pop music. Um, and I liked the themes that it had. And um, at one point, just sort of gave myself permission. I started... You know, I always listen to Johnny Cash, but I started looking for more stuff like that. That's sort of dark, somber, heavy um, folk music or, you know, Appalachian and Americana, old country. Because I love all the stories in it. I love the the song telling Mm -hmm. um, and the murder ballads and, you know, the stuff that they were talking about. I mean, there's so many old country songs that... um, you know, like Dolly has a, a like a number of songs that are about like unwed pregnancies or stillborn or murder ballads that you know weren't even allowed to be played on the radio. Um, and so I started looking more and more into that, and you know, I had these two separate lives of of listening to you know all this new wave and post punk and that stuff and then the country stuff and then i started to notice that a lot of the themes were the same and then i started to notice that if you go into the 80s and 90s the guitar tones are the same you get that Mm -hmm. same sort of tremolo chorus reverb really fill you know creates a lot of space sort of guitar tone um and then you know you just have catchy hooks and and good songwriting on on both sides um and i started to think of how, you know, how could I sort of put this stuff together? And I heard a Fish Mode song off of their album, Exciter. Uh, I think it's called Dream On. It's the first track on that album. And a lot of people don't like that album because it's missing a member, but I sort of like the emptiness in it. But that first song has, you know, one of those ticky little Depeche Mode beats with a, um, with a really dirty, gritty, mean acoustic guitar on it. And I was like, yes, this is mm-hmm. what I want. And then when I started to hear, you know, different synthwave songs, I started hearing, you know, more of that gritty guitar on them. And when I was listening to, you know, Appalachian folk music or Americana or something, I started to hear these, uh, like, damage beats to them. I was like, I want to make a band of just this. This is the music that I want to hear. And if I want to hear it, then I'm sure other people do as well. Um, so I went out, uh, ran up a credit card buying, you know, a little focus, right, um, interface and learning to use Reaper and, and just went to town on, you know, YouTube university and put together about a half a dozen of crappy demos where I played all the instruments on it myself. My thinking was that, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can on here to get the point across and then I'll find musicians who are better than me to, you know, fill those gaps, and um, and besides banjo, never found a banjo player, so <laughs> no, that's me. Um, I'm a pretty mediocre banjo player, but uh, I do my best. Um, I would love to find a teacher, but I feel like claw hammer banjo is one of those things you have to maybe run out into the mountains with like a bottle of moonshine and find some like 90-year-old tree sprite to help you with or something. Um, so it's been hard to learn that on my mm-hmm. own, but I was able to learn all of the, uh, you know, at least rudimentary recording stuff at that time. Um, and, and just wanted to do anything that I could to get those ideas together. My songwriting is, uh, like a very sort of macro thinking. I, I hear the whole song in my head at once and sort mm-hmm. of 
know how I want it to feel, but it's, um, you know, kind of blurry, you know? So I, I come at songs, maybe like a, like a sculptor would where, you know, I'm just, you know, take away everything that's not the sculpture. You know, you take, you just sort of, oh, flub around on the guitar or something mm -hmm. like this. And then as I work on it more, I, I refine more and figure out exactly what it is that I want. But a lot of times, um, lyrics come first with melodies with them and and i sort of hear the rest of the song of how i want it to sound um and because it was such a new different idea that at least i haven't really heard anyone doing at least in a particular way that we are um uh i knew that i needed to make uh, some tangible things to listen to to try to get some folks on board um mm -hmm. and put ads up on Craigslist and eventually, you know, got some people that could help me refine some of those parts. I mean, I've been playing guitar for like 20 years, but I try to find guitarists that are, that are better than me. Um, and that's still how I do things. Even with the band now, um, sometimes if I'm having trouble in a part, I bring it in and, you know, sometimes I bring in a demo and they go, Oh, I have a part that'll work better than this. But mm -hmm. for the most part, um, I pretty much write, everything uh uh myself as a demo and, and then sort of present it um with the exception of um destin who is destin lacornu um he's still involved in the band but he's not technically a member he he did a really a uh, real big number on on helping me with some of these songs there were a few that i just had a vocal melody to and he has perfect pitch and is just a ripper and uh, he was able to come up with some really beautiful finger picking parts just for my singing to figure out what chords are underneath it, so on and so forth, etc. Um, but all that to say, you know, uh, they sort of all come to me at once and then I try to figure that mess out. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I, uh, I really like uh, the fact that, you know, you, you point out that you have like a, a big background of uh, gothic music, which is something that I also love. So that's, it's really cool. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to something like this, um, you know, I definitely get, you know, trying to find so many artists, um, trying to find out, you know, what you need to play and things like that and writing demos and stuff. So it's not fun. Um, well, especially when... you, sorry, I appreciate you, you know, bringing up that you like, different gothic things one of the things that i worry about with what we're making is that it's either going to be like too twangy or too spooky depending on the audience so i get really excited when um you know especially people who are into any kind of gothic stuff mm -hmm. uh, say oh well usually i don't like any country but i you know i really like what you're doing um that's you know just such a good vote of confidence forward yeah. yeah i mean like when it comes to country music it's it's definitely like the older stuff is definitely gonna be a lot better than what's coming out now um national yeah. industrial complex yeah it is just like the everything with like dolly part uh, part in um you know johnny cash all of them they used to talk about a lot of dark stuff so i mean i think that's where a lot of it does come from where it's where i would listen to like older country um I, I feel like that that type of that type of lyrics that would come out now is not very popular anymore as how it well, used to be. We're getting there. Um there's there's a really big wave um and a big way happening just under the surface of, of that music. And mm -hmm. I would challenge anybody who says that they maybe like listening to someone like Willie Nelson or uh patsy klein or loretta lynn or something like that like if you like any of that older stuff or outlaw stuff um the new they were calling it alt country now it's more just called vaguely americana there's so many good people coming out that have that timelessness to them i mean leading the charge although a little bit more commercially is chris stapleton um mm -hmm. you know a lot of people even if they uh, I mean, everyone should hate the stadium country stuff. I mean, <laughs> whatever, I'm not going to fight you, but, um, you know, 
between we have Chris Stapleton, we have Margot Price, we have Brandy Carlisle, we have Jason Isbell. Um, they're a high women. There's so many good people coming out now that are just like right under the surface or like shovel mm-hmm. the rope is almost like like sort of a twangy white stripes. Like I yeah. honestly think um, that Americana is like the new rock and roll. Uh, so there's not really any new rock bands coming out. Um, you know, I was like playing a game the other day and like unlocked a rock song and it was Imagine Dragons. Like, there's oh, not yeah. Really, yeah, no, that's like the, that's like the nothing. new, it's like uh, the new alternative rock uh, stuff that's coming out now that they're considering. But no, I could, I could see your point in it. it it's, you know, I mean, there there is certainly stuff out there. There are, but no one that's like winning Grammys or breaking the charts. Like rock is not on top anymore the way it was in the '90s, and the '80s, and the '60s. Um, and I think that what a lot of people are doing is is finding value in in that songwriting, in that you know structure of of good old country music that, you know, was on, was king in, in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're coming back to that like simple structure and you're getting a lot of people who were like, uh, John Moreland, I think used to be, uh, like a screamer and I can't remember what his old band was, but like a more hardcore band. Mm-hmm. And now he just plays guitar and sings like super sad ass mm-hmm. songs. And, and there's just a bunch of like hardcore dudes in their thirties and basketball shorts just <laughs> crying their eyes out of these shows. There's so many people that were like in metal bands or rock bands that just got sick of that scene or that grind, right. which is where I find myself and found ways to express themselves authentically, you know, um, with this now. Um, but there's just, I, I feel like it's just bubbling under the surface and, something's going to give with uh with nashville because more of these more of these folks are starting to break through brandy carlisle and jason Isbell both have um mm-hmm. grandies now and are just songwriters songwriters they're just they're just great brandy carlisle just um sort of rick rubin to tanya tucker album and finally got her a grammy that she's deserved for like 40 years so yeah. um I, I do think things are happening for guitar music um it's just not necessarily in in the rock and metal scene right now which you know maybe it'll be back on top again but who knows who knows what's coming in the future that's true um so when was the the turning point that you wanted to become a a full-time musician I mean, again, pretty much always. I was just in my little town on our farm, just wanting to play music and make art and Mm -hmm. uh, find a way to do that with my life. And even uh, I'm a tattooer. I've done tattoos for 11 years and I love tattooing. But part of the reason that I got into it was because I knew I could tour. You know, I knew I could take that anywhere. Um, I sort of fashion myself like a like a turn of the century vagrant or something like i'd like to think that i could find you know that i could hustle up some work or a show or something at uh you know anywhere at any time so Mm um i'm just wired that way um i think i would be total shit at at an office job um and that's been proven to me by my inability to follow spreadsheets with tattooing Mm -hmm. you know i'm just terrible in anything like that. I've just always wanted to um, be on the road and, and play songs for people. Being on stage mm-hmm. is the best feeling there is. And if you can play at any venue, like anywhere in the world, where would it be? God, anywhere in the world? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I guess in, in America, uh, for me, for what I want to do, I would say the Grand Ole Opry. Um, mm-hmm. But in my future, I would love to. There's this cool venue in Tennessee that's uh, literally in a cave. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's very cool. But I mean, uh, I don't know that I have enough information about European venues, but like I would love to do 
a European tour as soon as possible or, you know, go to Italy, go to London, go to Canada. Um, the thing with touring, though, is, too, you never get to really see the place that you're in. Um, that's true. Seen a lot of a lot of highways, uh, and that's and that's about it. Yeah. But you know, if I if I could play anywhere, um, since I was a, a wee baby, I always thought um, I would love to be on the Muppets. <laughs> that meant that you made it. You're a mainstay in in all of entertainment, uh, just like the Grand Old Opry, <laughs> probably. And they're probably like neck and neck. Um, and I also thought when I was a kid that I always wanted to play the bronze and, 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 the, and Buffy. Um, but that's not a show anymore. Maybe, you know, if Joss Whedon weren't such a, a jerk, they would reboot it and I'd get my chance. <laughs> but, uh, I get, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, if you can book the, if you could book your dream tour, who's it going to be? Uh, who would it be with? Is it just going to be yourself? Uh, how many artists can I pick? Uh, that's up to you. Oh, man. See, this is where I get myself into trouble <laughs> with the, both the country and the goth thing. Because mm -hmm. half of my heart wants to say Dolly Parton on Orville Peck and uh, Brandy Carlisle or Jason Isbell. And the other half of my heart says, you know, that I'd want it to be like the cure. <laughs> Um, but I don't know whether Robert Smith would really like me or not. Um, but like the cure and Drab Majesty or like Kate Bush or, you know, something like that. But honestly, if I could get on a tour with Orville Peck, that would be, that would, you know, that's where my sights are set now. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, uh, you yeah, no, I, I would love to see that happen. So um, we should make that happen. Just uh, just start calling everybody that you can and just make that happen. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Do you think that the uh, experiences of the past year had any impact on your writing? Um, to be honest, I haven't done much writing in the last year. We recorded, um, we recorded our album. And in, in some ways, it was nice to have the space to do that. Um, Destin LaCourneau, he has a, a studio, Sunset. I think it's Sunset Studios now um, mm -hmm. that he just opened. But his studio is insane. And he's so, like, he's just a genius with that stuff. And he has all these, like, all the best plugins and rack mounts that you could, you know, we were recording vocals on a Neve 1073 with ribbon mics and, and got to just um, sort of experience like a recording playground that made me feel a little bit like I was like in the 70s, you know, like I was like the queen or damned or something, um, you know, just getting to play around with stuff with no pressure of, of anything else. I mean, None of us were working. So that was nice. Um, sort of took a break from writing because I didn't, to be honest, I didn't want to get too frustrated. I figured I'm not even playing these songs out. I'm not going to start writing more songs and, and get more, um, you know, just feel more down about it. Um, so I have a, a, a couple of things that I've worked on, and little snippets and lyrics and stuff like that. But um, my whole focus very business minded um and my whole focus was that by the time we could play shows again that we would have the best possible chance to just hit the ground running um so i was hard at work you know getting a website together getting photo shoots done getting the album recorded working on artwork for it um if you see the the cover for sarah um with my jacket on it that probably took me about 200 hours to make that jacket so that took up a better part of, of some time there i did get some help with it um but uh yeah i just i think i was a little too bummed out even for me to uh 
work on on writing because writing sad songs makes me happy so um you know it, it was it was just too tough it wasn't the right time for that um it's, it's just now i'm just now sort of getting back into the posture of writing and recording uh we may be putting out a, a christmas song for a, a charity fundraiser so i've been working Ooh. on that but um yeah i don't know about you but not being able to go to or play any shows was just like it just reinforced how much i need that in my life yeah how much i need to play out be on stage and and be touring and and you know be a musician and the um like live broadcast shows uh i, I know some people who, who do a really good job at them but uh they just kind of bum me out more <laughs> so uh, we did a few of those and then just kind of got too depressed by it do you have any future dates lined up yes um so right now we are gearing up for our album release uh we're gonna have a huge party for it if you're listening to this and you're anywhere near pittsburgh please come um you're calling it the album release rodeo uh it's gonna be at spirit and in, in the lodge uh tickets are 15 dollars, and we are going to have three bands as well as three drag performers oh. and we're gonna have the drag queens come up on stage and perform with the bands. Uh, so they'll have their own sets in between the bands as well, but we want to integrate them together. Uh, and we're encouraging people to dress up for it. Um, the event is sponsored by Liquid Death Water. So whoever wears the biggest hat is gonna get a tattoo gift certificate <laughs> and a case of Liquid Death. Um, and I'm just, I just think it's gonna be the dumbest, most fun, event uh possible um i really hope that a lot of people there have never seen a drag show before it can be exposed to some of the incredible art uh that these folks are making and you know that some of the people who come for the drag will be exposed to some some kind of cool music that they've never seen before uh and i'm really excited to meld them together i'm really excited to make sort of a goofy campy event uh and we will have cassettes and vinyl and bandanas for that and i'm really doing everything uh that i can to try to promote that event because uh it's gonna be a good time that's awesome so. uh i wish i was closer to pittsburgh because i'd go do it <laughs> we're like five hours apart so <laughs> it's, it's a pretty far drive where are you located uh we're in scranton, oh, scranton okay. pennsylvania well, we'll have to add that to our list. Maybe I'll hit you up about some good venues out there. Yeah, uh, there there's definitely a few venues out here, um, mainly bars, but they're definitely fun places to play at. Great, yeah, um, yeah. We're we're mostly just super excited about the album release. I mean, we are working up. I wouldn't even call them tour legs. They're more like tour toes, but mm -hmm. we're just dipping our toes in and and starting to play some other cities and trying to get some, um, you know, some steady gigs in Pittsburgh as well. Um, but now that the album's done and it's about to be out, uh, we're going full steam with starting to book as many things as possible. Um, and I'm super excited about Sarah. I've gotten a lot of, um, you know, nice things said about it uh from friends and, and family and, and a couple of strangers but uh the singles that we picked to come out uh i i think show a really good range of what we have on the album yep. so we have uh oh goodness it's a little over a month and then uh, mm -hmm. we'll have our full album out well i'm excited to hear it and uh for my last question for you uh what do you think is the best thing about being an artist well, it's definitely not the money. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we as artists have a leg up on our level of awareness of others and awareness of ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's really important. I like to think of, I use this metaphor a lot, that your life is sort of like, um, like a house that you build. 
And when you're growing up in your formative years, uh, and as you grow, a lot of that is built for you by your environment, by your family, by your parents. Um, and I, I'm, I know plenty of people, and I'm sure you do too, that sort of just leave well enough alone and, and don't really do anything with that foundation or change anything about the house that was built, um, mm -hmm. even if it was built wrong, you know, uh, <laughs> even if their foundation is crap and their, their pipes are, you know, poisoning them and all of that. Um, and the people that I'm interested in being around are, you know, messy people because when you renovate, it's messy. Yeah. Um, if you tear something down or have to rip things down to the studs, it's it's messy. But at least you get to build your own foundation. And I think that innately, as artists, uh, we have a little bit of a leg up on that. I think we're constantly looking inward and, and outward and to see how we are perceived. Um, and I think we end up being a little bit uh, better at that understanding and better at doing those renovations and constantly looking at things and, and being like, oh, that's probably something I need to work on. Um, it's just maybe like a better emotional literacy for, for a lot of people who make art. And, and that's important. Um, decided in the last bit that I don't really want to be around anyone who's not working on their house. I right. like messy people. So um, I would say that, you know, just the deeper art leads us to a deeper understanding of ourselves if we're willing to, to listen to that. Uh, and eventually, you know, if you're like me, sort of become a slave to it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree um, with all of that. So, um, you know, I'm definitely on the same page with you there. But uh, yeah, it was definitely fun having you on on here. Um, definitely excited to see uh, your album coming out soon as well. Yeah, please go on our website. We have our pre-orders up now. Please, you know, save Sarah or the album to a playlist. Um, you know, back in the day, it was MySpace views that got people <laughs> shows, and today it's Spotify monthly listeners. So if you dig what we're doing at all, like throw a song on a playlist, share it with somebody. Uh, that's the best thing that you can do to help us out. Spotify doesn't make us money, but it does get us shows. So, and, uh, or you can just give us money and buy one of our albums. That's but, <laughs> um, we have some, some great stuff up on our website, bonnieandthemiramortals.com. Um, and we're going to keep putting out more content after the album. We have remixes coming up and, and all sorts of stuff. So please uh, follow along. Can anyone else find you on your um, anywhere else besides Spotify and your website? Yeah, I mean, we have all the socials besides Twitter because I'm genuinely bad at it. I even have a TikTok. <laughs> um, it's Bonnie and the Mirror TikTok on Instagram. We're Bonnie and the Mirror Mortals. Um, we're on Facebook, all of that. But everything's up on our website. You can find links to everything from there. Uh, but we mostly do everything through Instagram, our website, and Spotify. Awesome. Well, it was fun having you on here. Hope to see you again. Great. Um, thank you. Yeah, and we'll see you guys later. You got